Greeting. Thank you very much for coming. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Even in the back? Yeah, okay. Um, I just saw some old friends here. It's wonderful. I mean, it's a nice occasion to meet people, I guess. And this, this festival is, I was expecting, you know, a couple of authors and a few room, <laughs> rooms filled. This is a big deal. This is really <laughs> one of the best uh, events I've ever been associated with. And um, my topic is the country over the fence. It's about, about Mexico. I've been writing about Mexico. I've been traveling in Mexico. Um, and, but before I talk about that, I, I want to talk about uh, um, just travel writing in general. Um, I began, I joined the Peace Corps in 1963. It was my alternative to getting drafted and going to Vietnam. So. I, I joined the Peace Corps and I was sent to Nyasaland. Is Nyasaland a familiar name to you? No. <laughs> because they changed the name to Malawi. Uh, so I, but I went there, when I went there, it was a, a British territory um, with about three million people. It's now Malawi with 14 million people, a million of which are orphans. Um, when I went there, I was... Um, do you know the, uh, the word uh, individuation? Individuation is finding yourself, going away, separating yourself from your home, from your family, from the people around you, going away, and, be, and finding out who you are and what it is you want to do, individuation. Um, so I come from a big family. It was only when I went away, when I went to Africa, that I discovered what I want. Well, I discovered who I was because I was anonymous there. I made friends, but I had no one leaning over my shoulder telling me what I should do or where I should go. I was speaking to people in their language because at that time the Peace Corps taught everyone to speak um, fluently in the language. The language called, was called Chichewa, which is uh, similar to Swahili. Uh, are any of you familiar with that? <laughs> okay. One of the great proverbs in, in Chichewa is. Uh, if your face is ugly, learn to sing. <laughs> and another one. Anyway, many. Walila uh, mbula, uh, walila matope. If you want rain, you also get mud. Anyway, so, so I learned this language. I was, uh, I was Buana, or Bambo, as they called it. I was a father. And that, that was the beginning. My life began then. I, I went to college, I was in, I was in uh, a good high school. Mike Bloomberg was uh, a classmate of mine at my high school. So it was a good high school. He went in one direction, I went in another. But, so I, I, I don't lament the high school, Medford High School, Medford, Massachusetts. And um, Bloomberg and I were in the uh, Boy Scouts together too. Uh, and funny, uh, he had a marksmanship merit badge. He's now against guns, but... <laughs> he, 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 was, <laughs> he had the merit badge for marksmanship. So Bloomberg, good guy, um, but he went in a different direction. Anyway, so I joined the Peace Corps to avoid going to Vietnam. I became a teacher, and I discovered I, I wanted to be a writer. I had actually was a pre-med student, but I, I thought, well, Chekhov was a doctor and a writer. I can do both. I decided in the end that I could be a doctor. And I discovered another thing, that I had something to write about. In college, uh, that was the period of uh, the wasteland, Beckett, uh, you know, what's it all about, kind of post-war on UE. But I had a real subject, real people, and real crisis, decolonialism, uh, 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 decolonization. So I was, I discovered the world suddenly and wonderfully, and I, I loved being in Africa. I was actually terminated early from the Peace Corps. Uh, uh, I, they didn't say kicked out, but I, after, Almost two years, I was involved in a political um, mix-up. Um, it was actually the, assass the assassination of the president. Well, I, I, was, I was unwittingly um, involved in it. A man just asked me, can you do a favor? Can you pass this message? Can you do this? Can you do that? I also, I was, I was 22, so I, I ran a, a school. that Everyone, I was way beyond my, um, uh, it's, I think they call it the Peter Principle, where I was, I started off as a teacher, and I quickly became the headmaster of the school. So, but 
the doing someone a favor and another favor and another favor and another favor meant that I was, I became involved in a plot, I get kicked out. But I stayed in Africa and um, I, I, I moved to Uganda. I then were, became, I was a stringer for Time Life um, and I traveled around. I was in the Eastern Congo when the mercenaries took over in the Southern Sudan. Um, I didn't go in, but uh, I wrote about the border there, the, the, the border wall, the, the uh, liberation movements of the southern Sudan were active then. That was 66, 67. And then um, I was in, there was a, a very turbulent period in Uganda and um, uh, I was married at the time and um, there were riots and I decided to move. So I got a job in Singapore. Anyway, that's just by way of introduction of saying that I kept, I was presented with new landscapes and at the time, I was, I published my first novel in 67, 50 years ago. Uh, so, and I was publishing a novel pretty much every year uh, from 67 onward. But then um, needing, uh, well, uh, uh, needing an idea, I decided to write a travel book. So I, took, I decided to take a train, leave London, I lived in London at the time, leave London and just take trains to Paris, to Istanbul, to Tehran, into Afghanistan, then took a bus through Afghanistan, then trains all the way through. So it became the Great Railway Bazaar. Um, it seemed like an easy idea. I would write, and I would write about um, my uh, 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 encounters with different cultures. And actually, this is the point, the first point that I wish to make, which is, at that time, lots of people were writing travel books. And the subject of the travel book was not necessarily the place the person was in, but the person traveling. It, it was a very old-fashioned way of writing travel books, but it was, for a long time, the way. Where um, it's kind of, it was devised by the English. It's a bit like, um, um, being a restaurant critic, or where you go to a place and you say, you know the restaurant critics, they, they, they go and they, they get a meal and they say, oh, um, I had the risotto, it was uh, not fully achieved. <laughs> so they would go to, um, I mean the theory, was they, they would go to Liberia, Graham Greene, and say, it's not ready, not really fully achieved, not ready for prime time, whatever it is. Graham Greene was in Liberia, Peter Fleming was in uh, Brazil, and other places. Peter Fleming said about Brazil, um, Sao Paulo is much like Reading, except farther away. <laughs> so you say, well, okay, great. Uh, uh, gee, I guess you've summed up Sao Paulo. <laughs> then, so, so I, there was a bit of that in me too. At the time, th 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 this was, even in war, um, in the Mediterranean, it said, he saw a sunset in the Mediterranean. He said, the sunset in the Mediterranean was one of the most vulgar displays I've ever seen in, in art or nature. <laughs> Criticizing a sunset? <laughs> you know, fussy, think I'll go to another sunset. So, <laughs> so I wrote, anyway, that was kind of the way people were evaluating countries, which is, I didn't have a very good time, or I had a very good time, or the people are funny, or they talk funny. Um, aren't, they, aren't they marvelous? Aren't they not, you know, uh, uh, not coming up to scratch, whatever it is. And so there were lots of books written that, that were kind of extensions of the travel writing of the 30s. Even War, Graham Greene, Somerset Maugham, lots, lots of, well, he was traveling in the 20s more. And so there's a bit of that. And so I wrote a book about the Railway Bazaar, and I wrote a book about um, uh, traveling around Britain, I went to China, I took every train you could take in China, and I was indulging a bit of that too, which is, you know, um, not having a very good time, I'm having a very good time, um, uh, the food's funny, uh, the people are um, uh, uh, oppressed by their government. I must say, I, uh, I, I noticed that, I noticed that in 19... 86 and 87, that the people were having a, uh, uh, a terrible time expressing themselves. So I, I put, anyway, I published the book, and I, I mentioned that the government was leaning on people. And 
There's something about telling the truth about a place, which is if you tell the truth about a place that you're going, it's likely to be prophetic. And you just see things as they are. You don't say, you don't say what's going to happen. You just say, you describe things as they are. When you describe things as they are, you're sometimes indulging in a kind of futurology without, without realizing it. Because you've described, you, 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 you know, people used to go, come to London when I lived there, and they would say, oh, we took tea, or we had tea, or and it, it's delightful, it's quite wonderful. And you'd say, um, where'd you get that? And they would say kind of Henry James or Dickens. They looked for Dickens London. Well, London was full of thugs, full of uh, soccer hooligans. Um, down at Heel, it was very hard to get tickets to Wimbledon. I never saw, you know, Henry James London or Dickens London. All I saw was kind of rough and tumble London where people were paying a lot of taxes. The education wasn't very good. and uh, people. I was paying 83% tax on marginal amounts. I mean, that seemed a lot, of, a lot of money, and I wasn't even earning that much, and I thought, what am I getting for it? My kids weren't getting a good education. I was kind of angry. Then people would come in, oh, we had tea, we went to Wimbledon. Oh, have you seen the play? Have you seen um, was, uh, uh, Phantom? They say, have you seen Phantom? <laughs> I haven't seen Phantom. No, I'm trying to make a living. I haven't seen <laughs> Phantom. But people would come over and say, and see the plays. And, and yet there was London sitting right there, um, uh, kind of underfunded, the, 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 the escalators at Pancras Station were made of wood. So one day, they caught fire, because you could smoke. <laughs> you could smoke. They caught fire. The writers who came to London, travel writers, whatever, weren't describing what London or England looked like. It was very down at heel. Now it's more prosperous. It's, uh, there's investment there and so forth. But I'm talking about the 1970s, when uh, there was bombing, IRA bombing. And they were bombing civilians. So anyway, um, that's, a, that's an example of a travel writer uh, uh, saying, I didn't have a very good time. And I indulge in that a little bit myself, I suppose. Uh, Pico might be a better judge of that. Did I, I suppose? Well, I don't know, you say I know. Uh, Pico Iyer is another uh, wonderful travel writer here. Um, but you know, what I'm, you know what I'm saying. So, so I, I then took a trip from, uh, uh, you know, from um, Cairo to Cape Town, overland. And it was a very tough trip. I got um, shot at. I was intimidated. And the manners that I knew, when I was in Malawi, when I was a teacher, the people were very respectful. Suddenly people were not very respectful. And, um, and there was a lot of uh, uh, aggro. And, and w really, the worst thing that can happen to you in, in travel is for a teenager to point a gun at you. Everything else, diarrhea, bowel-shattering meals, is nothing, you know, nothing compared to just a punk with a gun. So that happened a couple of times, too. And I didn't like it. And also in Somalia, uh, the, 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 the people called the Shifta, the Shifta were um, roaming the northern desert of... Uh, Kenya and the southern part of Ethiopia. And they, I was in a truck, and they were sh they shooting at the truck. Well, OK, suddenly, it, as a travel book, it, it was a very hard trip. I wrote about it. But it, it was more about not I had a bad time, but why are these people doing this? And I began to think that that's perhaps what, what travel should be, trying to find out, not criticizing the sunset or the food or whatever it is, find out. Why is this happening? Why is this happening? So I, um, subsequently, I went to Angola. And I had a similar experience. Same thing, abuse, uh, aggravation, threat. And then seeing one damn thing after another and thinking, uh, in Angola, um, it's an oil company. They, they, they were, they were uh, making something like $95 billion dollars out of their um, oil pumping out of the ground, and the kids in the schools had no books. And then uh, I began to think, well, why am I writing about one damn thing after another? Um, I'm, I, I couldn't get to the bottom of it. Usually in a country you say, if we have oil, we're going to be all right. Actually, one of the features of oil economies is the 
disastrous. Venezuela, Nigeria, Angola, they're corrupt and badly managed. So I began to think, what's happening in my country, A, while I'm peregrinating around the world? And secondly, I need to find a new way to travel because I'm not meeting the people I want to meet. I'm limited by taking a bus, taking a plane, whatever it is. I need to be, I need to, to drive to get to, get to a place. So um, to make a very long story short, I drove around the South uh, from 2000, and, uh, I started in 2012. Um, uh, it was the, o the second Obama um, election, 2012, correct? I, I, I set off in September of that year, and for the next year and a half, traveled through the South. I traveled, uh, but, but I defined the, the deep South, started South Carolina and went through to, to Arkansas. And it was a revelation. It wasn't about I had a good time, I had a bad time, or aren't these people made? It was an immersion in a culture and in a part of the country I hadn't known existed. Um, Allendale County in South Carolina is the third poorest county in the United States. And not just poor, but people have nothing. They live in substandard houses. They have, there's uh, child uh, hunger. Uh, they're only an hour or so from Hilton Head. You know, you've heard, heard of Hilton Head, but you just go an hour inland and you find people in dire straits. And I thought, well, this is amazing. Th this is the subject. This is not about um, whether I'm having a good or bad time kind of travel book, which is Graham Greene or you know, Evelyn Watts. This is about my own country, one of the most difficult things to write about, I may say. And it's, it's a subject which is, I have to lose my ego in this and talk to people and, and see what is the nature of the issue? What's the problem? At the end of it, so I traveled through uh, Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, and Arkansas, and uh, and wrote a book, and when Trump um, announced his candidacy, I thought he's going to win. He's going to win. I, I, the New York Times said that Hillary's numbers were very high, but I thought, based on what I had seen, and when, to get to the South, you're going to drive through New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, down. So I stopped on the way, and I had a very good um, immersion, let's say, in Middle America. What was worrying them? Uh, they, they hated Washington. They thought they were uh, uh, overtaxed. Uh, they were impatient. They thought they were overlooked. Uh, no one cares about us. Um, and they distrusted, in general, the Clintons uh, and and Hillary and uh, and 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 the, and the background of all that. But mainly, they would. They felt disconnected. They also felt China's eating our lunch. Go to any town of any size in Alabama or Mississippi or Arkansas, and you see a town that once made something. They might have made furniture. Forest City, Arkansas, they made television sets. They made shoes in, in, uh, 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 in no uh, uh, sort of north, northeast uh, Arkansas, sh big shoemaking. Um, or, or cotton, but cotton then picked by machines. But they uh, go to a town, they had made something. And they were proud. They said, catfish, whatever it is. This is the town that would be on the, uh, on the big, um, uh, there, there'd be a, a, a big chimney or something. You know, Greensboro, catfish capital of the world. No longer. The, the Vietnamese were supplying fish. So I, I, I found a part of America that was disappointed and a tendency Earlier, when I mentioned um, China, I said, write what you see, and it's prophetic. My book was pretty badly reviewed. They said I'm too skeptical about, you know, the Chinese is re reforming and so forth. The book came out in 1988, and, and the reviews were mixed. The book sold fine. You know, books make their own way in the world. You don't have to worry about them. They just set them, set them free. <laughs> They'll go. 88, poor reviews. What happened in 89? Tiananmen Square, huh? How many people were killed? You don't know how many. But I had noticed democracy 
demonstrations throughout China in 86 and 87. And when, when the book came out, I said, you know, um, uh, 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 what, I, I don't know what I'm talking about. I was in the hinterland. I was in little, small, poor towns that, where, where people were carrying banners and putting up wall posters and, and um, uh, writing slogans. So the, just by writing about those in a very small way, I saw this, then I saw this, then I saw this, it added up, and the culmination was Tiananmen Square. So um, that, in a way, was a mechanism of, of, uh, that, that happened in the South. That my, my conclusion to the South was, we live in a very divided, discontented, and distrustful country, and, uh, and people hate Washington. And when a politician or a, or a candidate for president say, goes up and says, Washington is broken, it's a swamp, they're crooked, don't trust politicians, you say, he's my man, he's my guy, he, yeah, I agree with that. So anyway, it was Trump, no one believed me, so <laughs> I told you so. So <laughs> anyway, during that trip, um, I, I had some friends in uh, Tucson, I, I visited them, and uh, the guy said, uh, do you want to look at the border? And I said, he said, it's only an hour and a half away, or whatever. <clears throat> I said, yeah, I'd like, to, I'd like to see it. I had been to Tijuana. I'm sure many of you have been to Tijuana. How many of you have been to Nogales? So quite a few, quite a few. For dental treatments? Yes. <laughs> cross, you crossed the border? Yep. Oh, you went to Nogales, Arizona, or Nogales, Mexico? Nogales, Mexico? Nogales, Mexico, uh, oh, <laughs> far fewer heads. <laughs> okay, great. Anyway, the, I, those of you who, who were there, or even in Nogales, Arizona, if you saw it, you go down the end of a street, Gilmore Street or something like that, and there's a, a drugstore, and, and the sun's shining, and you park your car, and you put a quarter in the meter, and you think, gee, nice place. And then you see a fence, not any old fence, but a big, rusty fence. 30 feet high, roughly. This was my first, I had never seen a fence. I've, I've traveled in many countries, and I think, Pico, you could say, have you ever seen a country with a fence? Maybe Israel and Gaza, but, but other than that, China and Russia, India and Pakistan, you, there's no fences. We're going to discuss this tomorrow, but not only was there a fence, but there's a door in the fence, and it was a turnstile. And I thought, this is, so this friend of mine said, I, I said, do you come? He said, I go over for dental, uh, see, dental treatments. I said, okay, that's cool. Um, let's go. I, I can't even remember whether I had my passport. I think I just had my driver's license. So I said, okay, let's do it. And we walked down the street. This, I tell you, was an adventure. It was Alice going down the rabbit hole. We, we went to the fence. The man... Uh, uh, American uh, Border Patrol guy says, you're going through? Yeah. Shows, I think, they go, boom, 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 through the turns, through the fence that you can't see. You can't see anything there. You hear, you know, mariachi music and, and, and there's kind of whiff of tacos, but basically <laughs> you're going from one big country in, through a fence. So I went through the door of this fence, and I tell you, in a lifetime of traveling, I've rarely had such a rush of stepping into another country that was completely different behind a fence. And the fence itself, the, fe the, you, the fact that you couldn't see through, at that time, it's a different fence now, but at that time they used, um, to land planes in Iraq you need very big pieces of uh, steel. So they, they when, when those were decommissioned, let's say, they took these big pieces of steel and, and set them up. They used these old, uh, for a landing strip, I think. And, and th that's what the fence was made of then. It's, it, it's, it's now a fence with slats that you can, you can see through. You can just see through, so like a picket fence. But at that time, you couldn't see through it. And it also went on, it looked like, um, you know who Christo, the, um, okay, it looked like a Christo, uh, uh, Invention sculpture where you you see you, the Christo aspect was you see it fence and it and it wasn't just there it was there then up then down then over and that it just 
the most beautiful sculptural thing that it, what it represented, of course, was, is odious. It's keep those people out. But if you looked at it strictly as a work of art, it was, it was to me, amazing a, 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 as a visual thing. And then going to the other side, suddenly people are laughing, people are smiling, people are selling food, street food. No street food on the other side. Street food, music, dental, dental um, <laughs> implants. <coughs> and I came back, and, and it was the same thing. Walk over, walk back, through the turnstile. And I thought, this is amazing. I want to see more of it. So after I finished the, um, uh, the book about the South, I published a novel called Motherland, and then, and then kind of um, planned a, a, a trip. And I thought, and, that, and that, then of course, um, uh, Trump got elected, and it was abusing Mexican, the rapist, the murderers, and so forth. And although immigration was one of his pitches, and immigration is on everyone's mind. So that was a big pitch. I mean, Hillary's pitch for immigration was embrace the world, but actually, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, there's a category of immigrant called special interest aliens. Does that, do you know this expression, special interest aliens? They're not Mexicans, they're not Hondurans, they're not Salvadorans. They're Afghans, Iraqis, Pakistanis, Nigerians, Congolese, but special interest aliens. And they, are, they go into a, a separate prison, I guess, or a special ward. There are thousands of them. And so that's not like ah, the caravan or people want to come and um, mop the floor, whatever. Um, it, it, it's a whole different. So it's, you know, it's a little more complicated than stronger together. Anyway, th I thought um, I want to see more of this. And I needed. With travel in general, you need a plan, you need a plot. It, it, it's, uh, it's not simply leaving home, going, as I did in my 20s, went to Central Africa and see, landed on my feet. I, I thought, I want to see, I, 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 I need uh, a plan. And my plan was buy a car. I have a, a nice car, but I thought I'm going to buy a car in case someone steals it, say, I want your car. I'd say, okay, you can have the car, take it. I, you know. <laughs> I've been there before, you know, it, it, it's expendable. So I got a car that, you know, a good, good one, but serviceable, four-wheel drive, um, you know, car. But, and I thought, my plan was go up and down the border, uh, crossing the border, and then drive from my home, well, drive from my home to the border, then up and down the border, and then to towns in Mexico, the, the non-tourist Mexico, uh, not Cabo, not Cancun, but just where people are having a hard time living, you know, they don't see tourists, whatever, and then go down Mexico City, because my idea was we're on the same road, we're on the same road, that, that the road, I live most uh, half the year in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, Route 6 in Massachusetts leads you to Chiapas, there's no, I mean, that's the amazing thing. So the, the idea that, uh, it's a simple notion, but the idea that we're on the same road, we're facing very similar problems, appealed to me as a metaphor and as something actual. So I decided, I'll get, the, I'll get this car and I'll drive that distance. I just show we're on the same road. People are saying, don't do it, it's dangerous, it's, it's terrible, you know, you'll have a problem. Uh, and it's worse even when in, in Texas, they want you to be, Guys on motorcycles, you know, bikers, leather, teeth missing, crazy hair. And they say, man, I wouldn't go there. I ain't no man. I, I wouldn't go there. And you say, you wouldn't go there? Well, if you wouldn't go there, why am I, you know? A bespectacled senior citizen, you know. But I thought, well, bullshit, I, you know, I, I, I can do this. One of the worst things you can do in, in life is ask someone whether you should do, you think I should do this? No, man, I wouldn't do it. You know, let's go get a Big Mac. And you say, no, no, I think I want to do this. It's bad to tell people. You, but I thought people in Texas would say, yeah, go for it, man. And they said, no, no, stay away from it, stay away. Uh, 
I ignored their advice. I talked to locals. I talked to locals on the border. The first thing I found on the border was the border is not a knife edge. The border is a blur. It's a blur. There are hundreds of thousands of Mexicans come to the States every morning to work, to work in San Diego, to work in, uh, in, in, in um, Eagle Pass, to work in El Paso, to work in Laredo. They, they come across to mop a floor, to make a taco, whatever. They just go across. No one knows. Trump doesn't know it. Uh, a lot of people don't know it. That's how the, the, it's, it, the border is very, it, it's not just porous, it's, it, it's kind of all work related. People come over legally with, uh, uh, you know, 99%, I suppose, in the morning. They commute because Mexico's cheaper. So that's the first thing. And the other thing is, I discovered NAFTA as, a, as an idea. You know, good idea, help people out. But NAFTA, when you look at it, this is another Trump thing. Uh, the Democrats are saying NAFTA is a good thing, trade agreement. Well, is it? Is it a good idea to, to introduce GMO crops to uh, traditional farms in, in Chiapas, in southern Mexico? People who've been growing corn for thousands of years to introduce this Frankenstein crop. Well, they've kind of kept some of it out, but there, there was a lot of pressure. There's a lot of pressure by American companies to, to persecute uh, uh, Mexicans. When, when, the, when the Zapatistas took over Chiapas, the, the, the Chase Manhattan Bank told the Mexican government, sit on these people, lean on these people, Chase, Chase Manhattan Bank, lean on these people. And they killed, they went in to the village, the Mexican government went in, and they began killing Zapatistas or Zapatista uh, uh, sympathizers just to prove that they had power over them. Well, they didn't in the end. I mean, Zapatistas have been uh, controlling Chiapas for 25 years. But they get pressure from American companies. So what's an American company in NAFTA? It's, you find on the border, it's a company that is 100 yards from the border. It's in uh, 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 Mexicali, it's in uh, Ciudad Juarez, it's in Reynosa. And the workers are getting $7 a day, buck an hour. Well, I, I worked at the stop and shop in Medford, Massachusetts for $1.10 an hour in 1959, you know? Why should a Mexican worker be, you know, assembling Bose headphones or a, a Chevrolet be earning what I was earning in 1959? That's another thing. And why are they 100 yards from the Because it's easy. You just make the stuff and throw it over the, through the fence. Simple, huh? So obviously, the, 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 that NAFTA solved some problems, created others. There are 250,000 people in a colonia in, in Juarez, 250,000 in one uh, you know, community. There's one high school. One high school. So this is a benefit to people. And there's no hospital. There's just little clinics here and there. So obviously, that's another thing you find crossing the border. At, at one time, people went over the border to, find, to, you know, to chase women, to get drunk or whatever. That has been damped down. There's very little of that. What they used to call boys' town, zonas de tolerancia, uh, red light district, whatever. They hardly exist. They hardly, there's a little bit in Tijuana. In general, not much. So what happens on the border? The other discovery, the border is owned by the cartels because the cartels want to, uh, 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 want to own what they call the plazas, or plaza, the, the port of entry. That, those are the, that's the valuable area for, for a, of a contention because that's where you make money. And, you know, uh, the drug trade is a $100 billion business. And they're, they're serious uh, uh, about it. They, they, um, the Sinaloa cartel had more planes than the, than the, than the Mexican National uh, Airlines. They had 52 aircraft and submarines and helicopters. So th 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 these are, you know, it's, uh, what the guy says in, um, in The Godfather, uh, we're bigger than U.S. Steel or something like that. So, so it, yeah, so... Uh, and then um, uh, 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 El Chapo's arrest meant that all the other gangs began buying for dominance. That you learn on the border. So there's more mayhem now after uh, the capture of El, 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 El Chapo. There's more murders. And I suppose I was lucky, but um, I didn't have a problem. Maybe, you know, no one's interested in me. I, I was driving, as I said, but it's 
interesting. And to get across, the, the, the whole system of getting across is, to me, complicated and interesting. And I was inter interested mostly is where do these people come from? Where do the Mexicans come from? Well, they come from Oaxaca State and from Chiapas, poor places. The, um, the per capita income in, in, uh, in a place, average community in, 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 uh, in Oaxaca is about the same as Kenya. 3,200 a year, 3,400 a year dollars. So we're talking about you know, a, a very poor people who, who need some. People who are trying to cross the border to mop a floor, to uh, leaving their children behind and whatever. Discovered that on it. I needed a system. You see, what I'm driving at, what I started to say was that the idea of going to a country and saying, uh, criticizing the sunset or the food is not where, is not anything I'm interested in or have been since my last trip to Africa, which is, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, more maybe. And I began to think, I need, I'm not interesting. I am not, I'm not interesting. I'm just an old gringo um, there, wherever I am. These people are interesting. Their problems are complicated, and I need, and they have to be uh, front and center. So it's not a question of making jokes, style, the old, it's, there's something new has to happen. And um, the other thing I discovered, which you would never know if, um, if you listen to the stereotypes, is Mexico is full of writers who have not been translated into English. There, there are so many novelists. One of the things I decided to do in Mexico was to teach. So I became a teacher. I drove down through McAllen, Reynosa, Monterrey, Saltillo, and I became a teacher in Mexico City to writers. I, you know, you might call it a master class or whatever, but they, they were all bilingual, very good writers. Very few of them had been translated. And they're, they're terrific writers. A couple of them had been translated into, and had publishers. Mexico is full of writers, composers, artists, wonderful artists. There's one, uh, one of the best, a guy called Joshua Okun. Remember that name. The guy is terrific. Francisco Toledo, he's in uh, Oaxaca City. Great artist. I mean, the, the equivalent of uh, Diego Rivera or Orozco or any of those people, or Frida Kahlo, the equivalent. You never hear about them. And they're, more, and they're also very, very committed artists. Why did I teach? I taught because I wanted to prove, and I told the students, we're on the same road. And secondly, I needed friends. I needed to... I needed people to guide me and to advise me. And um, I needed, in, in, uh, in, in Spanish, the word is uh, gana el respeto or gana el confianza, the confianza, to, to, to win trust or win respect. And you, really, you have to earn it. So I said, when I went there, I said, uh, no one's being charged for this, and I'm not being paid. I'm doing this to show that we're on the same road, and because uh, I, I'm interested in your writing, and maybe we can help each other. And I ended up with 25, 30 friends, people who helped me. And uh, actually, it, and you can't really do much in Mexico if you don't have a friend. I made a lot of friends. Then I went to Oaxaca, and I studied. I sp spoke rudimentary Spanish. I studied Spanish. Then I kept. And so it wasn't a trip. It was a part of my life. I was spending my life doing it. It was a process of life. It wasn't, I'm getting on a plane, I'm going to this place, I'm going to stay for a month, I'm going to write about it. It, I, it was a whole enterprise of living, and um, of living my life. I don't have a job. I haven't had a job since 1971, and, um, or a salary, or anything like that. So I can actually devote, I can say, well, I'll, I'll, I'll stop doing this, I'm going to do this. So for two years, that was my life. I went back and I suppose it'd be like Doug Brinkley researching a, a biography. It becomes your life, you, and your family cares about it all the time. And, or Sean Penn making a movie, or Pico doing something. That it becomes all-encompassing and immersion in this, and everything you do is related to it. And so you kind of parachute out of your domestic existence into doing this thing. 
And so, um, I just want to say, uh, so, so living my life that way, learning the language, making friends, I'm a, um, an older guy. So uh, the other thing you find in Mexico is in the States, an older person is, is dismissed. We're anonymous. We're invisible. Older people, they're invisible. No one looks at an older person. In Mexico, an older person is a hombre de juicio, a, a person of judgment, a man of judgment. You're of, of uh, what they call, you know, uh, the third age, uh, the third stage of life. You, have, you, you are respected. So these people are saying, man, I wouldn't go, the, you know, like the bike, I wouldn't go there. Actually, uh, at a certain age, you get more respect in Mexico, more than you would get in the States. Um, so I found that surprising, gratifying, and a, and a, and a way of, of, of getting around. Um, I also thought I was driving my own car. And one thing, you know, I, I, in 1963 in, in Central Africa, I had a Land Rover or I had a motorcycle too, driving around. But I didn't have the same experience. Then later, taking trains, taking buses, whatever it was, um, I found it very limiting. Driving your own car, getting up in the morning, get in your car, go, go, meet this person, pick this person up, buy food. You can have, you know, beer in the back, whatever it is. You can, <laughs> your clothes, everything, all your stuff, all your stuff is in the car. It's amazing for a traveler to be driving his or her own car is such a liberating thing. Picking up hitchhikers. I got into a terrible storm in, um, it was in, uh, near Puebla, and, uh, and, and there was a roadblock, and so I went off, went off the road, I thought, oh my God, the road was collapsing, there was thunder and lightning. Then I saw three women under a tree. They waved me down, there were three teachers. Can you give me a ride? I said, yeah, yeah, get in, hop in, hop in. Because I was thinking, there were three got in the back seat. But, uh, I thought, if I'm screwed, if something happens, if the road collapses further, they'll help me. They'll help me push the car. And so we were talking, and their teachers, and they were on strike, and they had created the roadblock, and so on. we talked about the roadblock. But I thought, I got a car. I got three more friends. So we went to their place, you know, had a cup of coffee, talking some more. Then the rain stopped, and I went on my way. That never happens to the average traveler. The average traveler is just is, is looking for someone to help them. I was there. I was able to pick people up and, you know, give them a ride and help myself. Also, changing plans, going into the Mixteca Alta. Mixteca Alta, which is bad roads, way in the middle of nowhere, but just bumping along, picking up people. And um, I, I thought the liberating aspect of driving is something that's very, very helpful to the writer, the writer's mind. I, w I was down on I-10 in November. I-10 I goes right through here, right? I, I drove here from Cape Cod, Massachusetts to LA, to Long Beach actually, just for the hell of it with my wife. I wanted to show her at Arkansas, which is a, you know, a problem state, I thought. Uh, more of a problem because they can't sell soybeans. I wanted to see the border. I said, well, just, we'll drive, you know, uh, into the south, along, you know, through Texas, down. I-10, came, ended up in uh, Blythe, uh, Tucson, Phoenix, Blythe, Needles, I don't know, Rancho Cucamonga, and then <laughs> Long Beach. Got rid of the, it was amazing, it was wonderful, it was wonderful. And um, you start to realize the truth of um, Jack Kerouac, you know, the Jack Kerouac, his, he was hitchhiking of course, but he was talking, the open road. And I thought, I, I've discovered how to travel in Mexico, and I've, I've, and I've made discoveries. One day I was driving through the Mixteca Alta, on a very bad road, and there was a, an old man walking along the road, and I, 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 got, uh, I picked him up, and I said, how are you doing? I said, what do you, what's your business? He said, I'm a, I'm a campesino. I said, what's the name of this town? He said, it's called San Juan Bautista Coaxtlihuaca. I said, what's the meaning of that? He said, It's a Zapotec, Mixtec term. Anyone understand it? No. <laughs> he said, llano de serpientes. 
the plane of snakes. The plane of snakes. Well, a snake in Mexico is a noble thing. The Quetzalcoatl, the plume, ser the plume serpent. The Mexican flag has a, an eagle attacking a snake. Snakes everywhere. I thought, this is a great subject. So I said, uh, he said, what do you think? I said, it's a wonderful name, The Plane of Snakes. That's the title of the book uh, that will be out later this year. So thank you very much.